I remember once being told by a friend that he thought there was more chance him becoming Pope than me being a vicar. Dave, my friend, had bright orange hair and played bass guitar in a thrash metal band. He was hardly a pontiff in waiting. But you know, sometimes the call of God can come as something of a surprise. It reminds me of the story of how the late Bob Hoskins got into acting. Hoskins left school at the age of 15 with one solitary O-level. And he worked as a porter, a lorry driver and a window cleaner. He even picked bananas for a time on a kibbutz. But one day he was at the bar in the Unity Theatre supporting his friend, the actor Roger Frost, who was auditioning for a play. Bob had had a few to drink when suddenly someone gave him a script and said, You're next. He went into the audition and got the part. His friend Roger was his understudy and the rest, as they say, is history. Sometimes God's call can feel a bit like being tapped on the shoulder and then being told, you're next. But just like with Bob Hoskins, I think God also says, you can be so much more than you realise. The world is bigger and stranger than you thought and all kinds of things are possible. That seems to be at the heart of the story about Jesus calling the disciples to follow him. The story begins with a miraculous catch of fish. Then Jesus tells Simon not to be afraid. His life is about to change forever. And then Simon, presumably his brother Andrew, James and John, leave everything and follow Jesus. Now this is amazing. Let me explain and uh, I warn you it's quite a long explanation. The first thing to note is that the disciples were probably teenagers, young people. Jesus and the disciples would have looked more like a youth leader and a youth group. Not how they're often portrayed. Just as evidence of this, everyone back then had to, uh, over the age of 20, had to pay a temple tax. And in Matthew 17, Peter finds a shekel in the mouth of a fish. And Jesus says that that is enough. But that would only pay for two people. Tax was half a shekel each. So this was enough for Jesus, we know he was in his 30s, and presumably Peter. The others we can assume were exempt because they were not yet 20. So the disciples are young people, teenagers. Now Jewish children, back in the time of Jesus, began their education about the age of five in Beth Sefer, their version of primary school. The lessons focused primarily on the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And by the end of their time in Beth Sefer, they would know those five books of the Bible off by heart. And if you were a boy, it was at this stage that you would get to take part in your first Passover in Jerusalem. It is also the point that most people effectively graduated. Girls would then stay at home and help with the family and pretty soon would be married. And most of the boys would go back home and learn the family trade. If you were male and you were really, really good, then you got the chance to go to what I, I guess it was secondary school called Beth Midrash, where you would be taught by the local rabbi and you would memorise the rest of the Old Testament. At the time, you would probably also learn the family trade because only the very best students would take their studies any further. A very, very select few of the most outstanding students in Beth Midrash would go on to have an opportunity to study with a famous rabbi. These students were called Talmudim. A Talmud is a disciple. Now that's more than just a student. When a rabbi says to a Talmud, come, follow me. What the rabbi means is I want you to be like me, to know what I know, to do what I do, because one day you will be like me. Talmuds, disciples, would watch their rabbis closely. They would leave everything to be with a rabbi. It was a very intense and intimate relationship. But of course, it was only for the very few exceptional students. Now, Jesus was a rabbi. That's what they called him. And like any rabbi, he went about choosing his disciples. And giving everything that I've said, if you were Jesus and you were on a recruitment drive, where would you go? The temple, maybe. Or around the places of learning, the secondary school or Beth Midrash. After all, you would want to choose the very best students that were available. But Jesus goes to the beach to the shores of Galilee, and he approaches some fishermen, Simon, presumably Andrew, and also James and John, the sons of Zebedee. 
Now, James and John were partners with Simon Peter and were told elsewhere that they were learning the trade from their father. They were learning how to be fishermen. These weren't prospective Talmuds. They weren't waiting for a rabbi to come along and sweep them off their feet. They were getting on with life, learning and plying their trade. Then along comes this rabbi. Now, rabbis were massively respected. Rabbis had been part of the Talmudim themselves. They really were the top of their class, the elite. And yet this rabbi says to these fishermen, come and follow me. Come and be my Talmudim. You see, that's what I think of you. That's how much I rate you. You, you are the very best. Imagine, just imagine for a moment how Simon, James and John and Andrew felt when they heard this summons. And the contrast between what they were doing and what Jesus was inviting them to be that contrast was amazing. Luke tells us that Peter had been fishing all night and he'd caught nothing. Tired, frustrated, probably a little anxious. It's amazing how Simon keeps his cool when this land-dwelling scholar starts telling him how to fish. But Simon Peter calls Jesus teacher, epistates. The word can also be translated boss or chief. You're the boss, says Simon. And he lets his nets down and catches a huge haul of fish. Simon has an abundance of the very stuff that he was building his world around. But the contrast between that and what Jesus was offering him, following him, being like him, doing what he does, being a Talmud, that contrast was so amazing that who'd be bothered with fish anymore? So when Jesus the rabbi said to these fishermen, follow me, they drop their nets and without so much as a by your leave, they abandon all that and follow him. When Jesus calls us, he calls us completely. And as the hymn says, we surrender all. Jesus has said to you, every single one of you, come and follow me. Come and be my Talmud, my disciple. Come be with me. Take my yoke upon you. That's what they'd say. Take upon yourself my teaching and the way that I do things. God, as Os Guinness says in his excellent book called The Call, God calls us to himself so decisively that everything we are, everything we do and everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism lived out as a response to his summons and service. As Peter later said to Jesus, we left everything to follow you. That's what it means to be a disciple. You are called by God and God calls us to himself so decisively that everything we are and everything we do and everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism lived out as a response to his summons and service. Now, if Jesus has such a high view of what you can become in him, if he calls you to be his Talmud, then that must mean something quite significant. He thinks you're okay. Better than that, this rabbi has chosen you to be his disciple. And he's chosen you to do what? To fish. To fish for people. Do you know, when Jesus called James and John, they were working on their nets. Now, this isn't a minor detail, for as Jesus calls us to fish for people, he also wants us to work on our nets, to network. Our net is the web of relationships that we have with one another. And those relationships really matter. People who fish with nets apparently spend 90% of their working time repairing their nets and only 10% of their time actually, actually fishing. Our relationships, our net, need that devotion of time to cleaning them and repairing them. Our relationships matter because it's through our relationships that God draws people into his love and begins that gentle work of conversion. It's through our relationships that we're able to achieve so much that is of good to God's kingdom. Every day we see people, spend time with people, we make contact with people. And Jesus the rabbi has called us to be his Talmudim, his disciples. And he's called us in the totality of all that we are. And in the context in which we live our lives, including the network of our relationships in which we find ourselves. He's called us to fish for people. He's called us to make every contact count, to make the most of the opportunities afforded by the time that we have with people, to share with them something of the good news of God's kingdom. What a privilege. What a duty. What a joy. What a calling. Amen.